Business is messy and unpredictable. Sometimes lonely. So lonely. So lonely. (laughs) And inspiration can often come from really weird places. We pick up where the bullet point blogs and the highlight reels leave off. We start with the stories. Welcome back to So Here's My Story. I'm Jody. And I'm Elliot. And we are back for another week of stories and random things we've decided to record that we don't know where we'll go yet. Some of which <laughs> have to do with business. No, they always have to do with business. It just we don't they don't start that way, but Correct. we get them there eventually. We do. We wrangle them. Anyway, before we thank our sponsors and get started with this week's story, which I think is going to be a treat. I wanted to take just a minute to again mention our new segment that we're going to be inserting in a couple of weeks here where we share your stories. You know, up until this point, we've mostly shared our stories. We've had a couple of guests. We're having another one today, you'll hear. But we want to share many of your stories. So we're adding a new segment that will be at the end of the show where they will be around a particular theme. This first theme is my awkward interview. Maybe you're the interviewee. Maybe you're the interviewer. <laughs> That took way more concentration than needed. If you're either one of those, we're just looking for funny, poignant, embarrassing, hysterical, whether it's mistakes or oddities, just anything to capture the... Because, you know... Interviews are just rife with accidental real, I guess I'll call it. Well, there, um, <laughs> you've got some, in some cases, you've got high stakes, you've yeah. got nerves, and you've got people. And those things always yeah. combine. It's <laughs> like the Venn diagram for great stories. Yes. Everybody's on edge for one reason or another, um, trying to figure out the other person. So we want to hear those stories. You can email them to us at talk to us at so here's my story.com. You can also submit them via our Facebook page or on Twitter. You can use the hashtag my awkward interview and just go to SHMS podcast on both Facebook and Twitter. Yep. Thank you so much. There you go. All right. And just to point out, we did read one of those at uh, last episode. That's right. So um, we're not going to read any more though, because I want to save no. them. We're getting some really, really good ones, but I want I want a few more. So please, please, please submit a story. I know you have them. So <laughs> do it. For, do it for me. Right. Do it for Jody. Do it for Jody. <laughs> Um, So before we get into this week's story, let's uh, thank our patrons, uh, Tom Loveland at Mind Over Machines, uh, Cat's Copy, the architecture firm of GWWO, Herbert and Ethel Inc., and Mary Craft Staffing and HR Solutions. And if you would like to be counted among the number of our patrons, just go to our Patreon page. You can look up So Here's My Story. And uh, you'll find all the cool stuff and the reasons why these uh, companies became patrons in the first place. So you want to kick us off? I do. And it's, it's, as you alluded to earlier, it's not my story so much. This story comes to us from Chris Brogan. Chris is just a fascinating businessman, entrepreneur, consultant. He's uh, written The Freaks Shall Inherit the Earth, (laughs) Entrepreneurship for Weirdos, Misfits, and World Dominators. Uh, He's written Trust Agents. He's just a very candid and forthcoming and thoughtful person. I love talking to Chris. Well, he's it's why he was one of the first people we thought of when we were reaching out. Absolutely. And he always has a very interesting take on things. And so I had a chance to catch up with him. And uh, I don't always do this, by the way, this is a disclaimer. I don't always record everything that uh, every conversation I have when I catch up with people. But Chris, let me record him when we had a conversation. You're going to be getting side eye at every lunch meeting you have. Like. <laughs> That's right. Patted down for a dictating. Interview. So uh, he he sat down for a discussion and we're just going to play a, a little bit of it because there was so much in that discussion that we've decided to break it up because there are a number of ways we can go and we'll probably revisit this Chris Brogan discussion, but another part of it for a future episode. But for right now, take a listen to what Chris had to say about his best day and the impact of that and resting on your laurels. What was your best day that you would look back on and say, yeah, if I were in Groundhog Day, that's the one I'd do over again? Wow. Um, Man, I think I'm a pessimist. I don't think I have that kind of best day. You know, I love when I get to speak to lots and lots of people. Like I, I guess my favorite day in business was I was at social media moms a long time ago in Disney and I was speaking right after, um, uh, a supermodel. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I felt like, you know, here's the, 
two, I'm, I'm two after the woman who runs Builder Bear. I'm one after a supermodel and I'm uh, Kathy Ireland, by the way. And, mm. you know, these people are here to hear, hear me talk and I'm being treated like as much of a celebrity as any of these people. And it was just a beautiful experience. And I just had this feeling like the people in the audience, I was happy to serve. Disney was really happy to have me there. And I just really had this feeling like, wow, this is, this is big stuff. What's your takeaway from that? I mean, that's an incredible experience. So what do you hang on to that as evidence of something? Or do you go back to that in moments when it's clearly not your best day? No, you know what, I have a I have a very different view on this kind of thing. I am I'm horrendously averse to resting on my laurels. So um, I'll show you I'll tell you an example like this. Um, this person I know, his name is Master Chim. Uh, his real name is just <laughs> uh, he, he does uh, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu training and other stuff. Uh, he just recently did a contest, a competition for uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, where the awards were written in pen on the person's palm. And mm. it was like, you know, congratulations, Kevin, for first place, but written in pen on his palm. And he says, you can appreciate and, and cherish this award for as long as it sticks to your hand. And then you go back to work. Nice. I love that. And that to me is how I look at my best days or worst days. It's also partly due to some of uh, I've learned through Buddhism which is just that if you attach to either, you're kind of in, in jeopardy of some bad stuff happening. Wow. That's, yeah. I love that. Ju well, actually, there's two things I love about the jujitsu story. One, and I, I will not be able to remember the guy's name, but, you know, wonderfully sounding jujitsu ju master, master something. Master Jim and master then Jim. Justin. Okay, his real name is Justin. <laughs> um, that's, that's like out of a Napoleon Dynamite <laughs> yes, moment or something. Anyway, so I loved that. But, but more profoundly, what a powerful concept that, you know, writing this on your hand. So absolutely celebrate the moment. Yep. Like, do not step over celebrating the accomplishment that you have made and the hard work and what it has earned you. Mm -hmm. But that as it fades, that's only as long as you get to, I won't say dwell on it, but to have it be the thing that you then talk about. Right, right. In that philosophy, it's not part of who you are. It's not part of your routine to wander through your trophy room. Yeah. So, so I have to say, I am, um, I'm almost overwhelmed with the ways that I want to take that. So like, like where I went ahead with this and where I think it has value and importance and, and could relate it. So I'm going to ask you to take it someplace <laughs> and, then I'll, and then I'll call it down from there. No, fair enough. And I'll, I'll tell you, I agree. There are a number of things that occurred to me, but one that occurred to me that was a very real business issue where this comes into play is when I was chief operating officer of a software company and the software company had done very well throughout its, its existence, but it was at a juncture where it really had to expand into next generation technology. It, everything that it had accomplished was great. It had a lot of capital. It had a lot of clients, but it could not continue to serve those clients unless or until it, it came out with its next generation product. And as a matter of fact, I was brought into the company because the CEO was going to be devoting his time to coming out with that next generation product. And so I was brought in to run the company day to day while he did that. And so in order to, to develop that product, and this goes back to the late 90s, early 2000s, you had to bring in these rock star software guys. And they were making crazy money. They had signing bonuses of, you know, luxury cars and sports cars and just, just crazy things. And so what was happening was that there were a whole group of legacy personnel, the people that had been with the company since its inception. And they knew that the money that was being paid in bonuses to these new rock star recruits who hadn't done a day's worth of work for the company. Mm. Um, and we're was, also probably like 24. And right? we're also yeah. young and ah. you know, didn't necessarily, at least in the eyes of the legacy guys, didn't have respect for the past and their elders and whatnot. Um, so these legacy people were like, well, wait a minute. You're paying these huge bonuses to these guys who have done nothing for the company at this point. And the bonuses are comprised of money we helped make. Mm. Where's ours? And so the CEO, you know, because you don't have an infinite supply of cash, was saying, well, look, I, um, I think you're pretty well paid for what you did, but we've got to invest in what's going to happen. 
invest in the future. And I find that tension between paying some somebody for their contributions to the organization that they already made mm-hmm. and um, investing in people who haven't been there for a while but may represent the future. There's that tension. I find that just fascinating and difficult at the same time. Oh, it's wildly difficult. And, and I've seen it show up in a couple different ways. I mean, you're, you're pointing to when, when the, the organization is looking to not necessarily pivot, but they have to make a, a game-changing kind of step, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. So something, something yes. dramatic has to change or they will not forever be in business, most right. likely. They will definitely lose their clients to people who did advance and did develop. Yeah. So, so that's looking at it from like that meta level almost of like at the organization, it's a survival move of it the was, organization. Yes. Yeah. I think of it also though, in terms of, I, I think it happens even at the individual level, which we'll come back to this in a minute. Cause I want to stick with your story, but even at the individual level where forget that game changing necessity of, of having to pay attention to the business needs, but, um, you know, wanting to be compensated for what you've done versus looking at what do I need to keep doing? What mm-hmm. do I, how do I need to continue to, to um, evolve or contribute so that I continue to earn that money? So I, I, I right. can really see it at, at both sides, but I want to go back to your example for a minute. One thing, because, because every time I've been in on a conversation like that, and they're not always quite that dramatic where we're needing to make this big, big shift, but there's one thing that I've seen be helpful is, is it sounds a little bit goofy, but if you almost personify the company for a minute, if you imagine that it is yet another person, because this conversation I think gets difficult because you're looking at person A and person B and you can see both of their sides of it so clearly. Yes, like I see, yeah. I see what guy A who's been here forever feels. I feel, I see what guy B who we've just hired who can get this money other places. So mm-hmm. why not? Neither one of them is wrong. I guess that's, that's, that's where I think conversations feel really, really tricky when nobody's necessarily wrong. No, they each here. have a reasonable point of view. Right. Um, so where I think it's interesting is to take the, if you imagine the company as a person as well, so now there's this third entity, this, the, the company okay. and ask like, what, what does, um, you know, what does that company need? What, uh, if you name it, the name of the company, um, you know, like what does Wagenheim law need if we're talking about your company? Um, and it, it elevates the conversation, I think, because then it's not about like Bob's needs or Nancy's needs or Kevin's needs. It's like, what does Wagenheim law need? Um, and it just sort of changes the, the whole timbre of the, the questions, but well, it, it does. But if you look at the, you know, person A and person B, one is the legacy, you know, this is what we contributed. And the other is the, the new people coming in. This is where I will take us. I think that the legacy people may see that what does Wagenheim law need as slanted against them? Because doesn't that question say, well, what do we need for the future? And the legacy people are like, well, wait a minute, I got you here. Yes, but but I think the fact that this question, that this story is what came up for you when you heard Chris's story yeah. inherently means that that's the way it's slanted, I think. Because, it is in my mind. Cause, yeah, because if we're talking, yeah, no, that, that was, yeah. Because the legacy people, it, just like in Chris's story, you know, the award written on your hand, the legacy people clearly felt that that award, their accomplishments, their contributions was, were a lot more permanent than ink on hand. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. No. Uh, so, because I, I, I think I have a different perspective on this than you do. The way we're even talking about it is trying to make it binary in some way. And I think it's anything but. Right. This story of, of ink on your hand, to me, becomes a question that everyone constantly has to be asking, legacy or brand new. I mean, just because you walked in the door because you've got all the great new skills doesn't mean that 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 it stays that way. You still, that got you in the door that mm-hmm. wears off when the ink does. Right. Now, what do you need to be doing to contribute to the company? I think as a legacy imp- a person, just because you're not the right person with the new skill sets doesn't mean that you don't still have a fresh palm <laughs> that you can be writing on how you continue to, I, I think the trap of it is if you're imagining that your value is in your past contribution period at the end of that sentence. And I don't think anyone should ever, whether you're talking about a business situation or a marriage or anything, you should ever, that's what I love about this Chris Brogan story is I don't think, it's not whether the the legacy or the new guys are right. It's that none of us should ever be resting on the thing we did last week as our thing. No, that's true. And, and let me just um, 
briefly go uh, off into what may be a tangent and I'm going to say out what? loud what you what you? you know to be true which is <laughs> you can always just look at me and then say yeah okay let me take it back to where we really were going I will. but what occurred to me from what you were saying is that built into most compensation structures is the resting on your laurels uh, dynamic because you have somebody come in at pick a number forty thousand dollars a year and you give them a raise, and because I'm bad at math, let's go with 10%, $44,000. Okay, so the next year, they're earning $44,000, and they get a bonus. And then the next year, maybe it's 10%, so they're earning $48,400, and they get a bonus. And then it keeps going up, and building in that base salary level increase is resting on your laurels because pretty soon without any evolution of skills, you have the person that you originally valued at $40,000 is now making $65,000 where you could hire his or her replacement for back close to the original 40. And people build that into their salaries all the time. They, they do. And I, I don't think this is a tangent. I, I would say, though, that if that's how you're doing it, then you're creating that problem from the beginning. I, I, I mean, yes, I, I don't. I don't. And I've never worked somewhere where you, where you just simply got a raise because everybody got a raise. I mean, it was always part of an ongoing conversation of how are you continuing to contribute? What's your next your next thing. I think that I, I absolutely think you're right. If it's interesting, I think, I think that points to like, be conscious of what you reinforce. If that is how you gauge and measure compensation, then that is what you're saying you value, which is Tenure. being here longer. Right. Right. Whereas if you, um, what might look un, unfair to some people, but if you, if you have more of a merit based or contribution based, even if it seems wildly out of place, one year that your, you know, right out of college receptionist gets an outrageously big bonus or something because that person did something amazing. I, um, that I think sort of gets in front of that conversation. But yeah, if if it's just annual increases, then why would anyone think otherwise that that's where their value is? Right. And I'm surprised you say you've never worked anywhere where that's just built in because I've worked at a number of places where that's the expectation. Well, I get my annual review and let's assume I'm not going to be fired, you know, so I'm going to, they've found me worthy of staying on another year. I'm going to get my end of year bonus and I'm going to get my raise. And I've seen places where that's the real expectation. And so here's the challenge. If you're in 10 years easy, you can tell that, right? The anniversary sure. date comes and goes. And so the person's still here and they have tenure. But if you want to prioritize something over and above staying power, the challenge is that you've got to figure out what that is. What is it that for your position, the organization is going to value enough that they would like you to write it on the limited space of your palm? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the accomplishment that we want you to look at until the ink fades. And that's the accomplishment on which we're going to base compensation and other incentives. And I don't think a lot of organizations do that. Certainly not with the way that we're using this metaphor of like the, you know, the, the ink on your hand. I mean, I don't think the the goals come and go that quickly. No. So I want, to, I want to be careful we don't get get too literal on it. But um, well, it depends on hygiene, which goes back to it's a callback from our, <laughs> our previous episode. This is true. This Nicely is, done. What's this, that? that is, come that's on, actually really impressive. That. Yeah, because I can you. make that ink last a long time. <laughs> yes, you could. I, I could. Um, no, I think that, um, now see, you made me lose my train of thought. What you were what saying say. is that the goals don't necessarily come and go as quickly. Yeah, the goals don't come and go that quickly. So I don't want to get too literal about that, but I think that the wins, I mean, I'll, I'll say it this way. I also, cause I also think it depends on what your job is. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, I was interviewing one time for a position I had already met with the owner we had lunch he loved me i loved him i knew people who were already on this team it was a kind of a sales position sort of and yeah. i was all excited about it he thought i was going to be great i thought i was going to be great the, the women i knew on the team thought i was going to be great and they had me do this gallop he said there's just sort of this formality it's just it's just our way we, we do this gallop poll testing thing for fit and i'm uh, not gallop poll but gallop 
does the test for them. Hmm. So okay. I said, okay, no worries. Is so, that like a personality test or a behavioral um, uh, test? Sort of, yes. Yeah. So okay. it was a phone call and this mm-hmm. woman called me. She said, I'm from Gallup and da, 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 da. And I, was, I remember I was sitting on my bed at our old house and it was probably 40 or 50 questions and they were all wow. like A, B. And she's like, in this situation, would you A or B? And there were at least four different times where like, I, I literally said, well, I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to say B, <laughs> but my answer is A. And by the end of it, I was super, I walked downstairs and said to my husband, like, that's not the right job for me. And and the guy called me later. There's a point to this in, in a second. But the guy did call me the next day and he was like, oh my God, you did terrible on that. He's like, I, I, <laughs> I can't offer you this job. I said, we're good. We're good. Like, I know it's not the right job for me. This is the point though. One of the questions was, when you get a really big win, like if you landed a huge sale, Mm -hmm. would you want to like, you know, pop the cork and celebrate with your friends that you, you know, there was this big win or would it inspire you to pick up the phone and make the next call? And Uh, I was like, um, (laughs) yeah, because you know, pretty sure you're supposed to say, and, but this is the important thing. Dyed in the wool salespeople. I've told this story too, and they said, "Oh my god, I, I can't wait to make the next call, like because I want the next hit. Like I'm so excited for it." Yeah. That's not me. Like I, th- that's just not how I how I roll. So back to this point, like hmm. I, to me, if you're in a, there are some positions where writing that on your hand is just drives you to get the next thing to write on your hand. Yeah. Whereas my pace of excitement, like I like longer things where you're working harder to get to a bigger goal and then you celebrate that goal and have some fun. Anyway, I just thought that was a, it, it is interesting. And that could take us down a whole nother rabbit hole. Imagine which, that. Yeah. Imagine that. So I actually have a list of rabbit holes over here that I'm like, I'll, I'll bring this up later with a different topic. But <laughs> yeah, but because it, I was just interested that everybody thought you were a great fit for this, but they all deferred to the Gallup. <laughs> know, uh, right? And maybe that was the right call. <laughs> no, it was the right call. I can promise you that. By the end of the, by the end, because they were asking very legitimate things. But, well, oh my gosh, this could, this really should be a whole, this is why we're doing the My Awkward Interview segment though. I think inherently most people are really bad at interviewing because we're using our like, do I like this person skills, mm-hmm. like of natural human connection. I think it's hard to even notice I mean, I think he could pick up on the fact I'm a hard worker and I, you know, I would have worked my off trying to make that job work. But in the back scenes, what he couldn't or didn't see through to was that the way I'm wired is not that it is different than I need to be to be good at that job at a at a a, just a different pace. than I think you I think this is why interviewing is hard. Well, you like know, there's a science and an art to it. And, and there is. And I know I've spoken to our friend uh, David Lunkin at, at Mid-Atlantic Testing, and he, and he's always said that, and of course, this is his business, but he always says that you go back in times of stress, you go back to what you're hardwired to do, Yes. what your hardwired behavior is. And that's why he, and that's his business, would put such a, an emphasis on the results of behavioral testing. It's not personality, it's behavioral mm-hmm. testing yeah. um, over the fit and are we having a great time at this interview and yeah. have we established a rapport? But I think that it, it, it still leads back to the point when you talk about that behavioral testing, the behavior um, goes back to, well, what do I want to incentivize? What do I want people to write on their palm? What do I think people are hardwired to, to view as accomplishments and does that gel with or, or square with my organization's so view of I, that? Yeah, which actually makes me think that we're kind of looking at this all wrong a little bit. It's not what we want them to write on their palm. I, I think I think the focus is, because if you go back to Chris's story for a mo- mm-hmm. moment, the goal was not to write those words on his palm. There was a bigger picture purpose and vision and ideal that as an organization or as an individual that you were working towards. And it was in the, I think of almost as like you want to summit Everest. First, you have to get to base camp one and you have to get Mm -hmm. to base camp two. And you have to pause there and appreciate that you're at base camp one and count it as a step in the right direction. But it's just base camp one. And to me, it feels like that. And that is what, it's not about, if I were trying to use this story and how I would think about wanting to lead an organization, it's not as much about what do I want people to write on their palms as much as 
what do I have to do to make it clear what we're all working towards? To take it back to your COO story, like right. where are we all headed? And then along that path, what do each of us need to be striving for that we, if we get there, we'll celebrate on our palms? Like, well, right. Yeah. But, and so to the fit is it has to come from both sides. One is what is the organization view as where we're headed and, and what's important to the organization? And then do you have people who believe in that to such an extent, just like in Chris Brogan's story, the people that got a shot at writing that or having that written on their palm, mm -hmm. geez, they trained and they, they did everything they needed to do to get to that point because that was important to them. Yes. And so thank you very much because I hated your story that you added to his. It was like bugging me. It was dry. It was like something about it was like, I don't, I don't like this choice. I don't, I don't even quite know what to say because something feels wrong to me. And I think I, I think I got what it is. And of course, hindsight's twenty twenty, and I'm not even suggesting I would be this wise in the moment. But I think what was missed, what the opportunity that was missed in the story that you added to it, mm -hmm. was a number of things that could have happened before those people started getting hired that had the legacy people clear about why that was a good choice, excited about it, how how they could be wanting to write on their palms that they were welcoming these guys in and you know get like seeing the bigger picture. I know that's a big ask because when you talk about compensation that's a different story. So I, I'm not being super like uh, idealistic here or like rose-colored glasses about what it would really mean to people. But I think the bigger picture or or that thing that happens that magic thing that happens in an organization where everybody is rowing in the same direction mm -hmm. and doesn't mean that everything has to be equal. And like you realize that, okay, well, we need to hire this. I mean, I've worked with organizations where the leadership team has decided that they need to hire somebody who in that particular organization at that time is going to be making more than they are, yeah. but they've done it because they knew that that's who they needed to move the organization forward. Right. And I think, by the way, there's a whole other episode we are going to do on, <laughs> on that issue. And which, I, which, uh, the, on, on hiring somebody, hiring your replacement, hiring somebody who's making more than you are, you know, putting yeah. yourself second, even if you're the CEO. That's the, and I'm not asking that all those legacy people put themselves second. I mean, that that's sort of a weird, a weird thing. But but having that vision, understanding the why and the purpose. Well, and in fairness um, to the company, there was a lot of run up to the hiring of these new people in the new project. And everybody understood why. And I'm not, mm. I shouldn't really paint the legacy people as monolithic, meaning that, that <laughs> all of them right, resented right, right. it. However, you can understand the why. And you could be excited. We got this guy. We got, he's coming in, whatever. And you could really be excited about the direction and the promise that the company has and that that this company you helped build for 10 years is is getting itself in a position to exceed expectations in the next 15 years. But something changes when the black Audi TT that the new developer got as a signing bonus rolls up and parks. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and so that's that's where you have it. And then some of the people, um, I I would say resented it, uh, but I don't mean that emotionally loaded, like they were completely unreasonable, because I understood exactly where they were coming from. But you do have attention, and I see it in to bring it down uh, from my story to something that might be more relatable. You have um, people who have been with the company for 15 years and they haven't developed their skills enough. And so the new person coming in at 20, who's much more proficient in cloud computing and, and all of the new things, well, they're making more and they're going to be making the, the bonuses. Yeah. I, so I, um, I feel like I'm being very contrary today. So um, I feel like if that's when that comes up, I started to say that's a leadership issue, but but I'm not even sure who I want. I, I think both both parties in that play a fault. So there's a company, Blessing White, that I love a lot of their work. They do a lot of research and content development and, and consulting on engagement and whatnot. And mm -hmm. they have this engagement model that's that's just makes a lot of sense to me. And it has to do with like company contribution as well as personal satisfaction. But one of my favorite things about as you dig into their material is that like most engagement driven articles and whatnot out there, they do talk a lot about what is leadership and the executive and the manager's role in creating 
engaging employee relationships. But they also talk about what's the employee's responsibility in that. And there is There's responsibility on that side. And that's absolutely why I love that model because it yeah. doesn't skip over that part. And so in that story, you know, my first reaction is a huge swell of empathy about how how tough that is. But if that person doesn't develop themselves and then also if they're not getting any kind of feedback that they need to be developing themselves along the way, I think that is a slow burn tragedy, not something that just suddenly happens. And, you know, I see you're being contrarian, but I I could not agree with you more. I think that that it, there is absolutely a dual responsibility. And I'll go further. It's not just reminders or talks from leadership about how to develop yourself more. It's encouragement. It's a provision of resources. Yeah. It's opportunity to develop yourself more. You should, as a leader... I think it's only fair to to criticize the the employee for not having developed himself or herself adequately if you can honestly look in the mirror and say I've done everything I can to make it possible. Mm-hmm. And and they didn't they didn't meet me halfway. They didn't try or or they couldn't. I mean that's Or good. they couldn't. And I will add one other thread in this is I I think uh, this has bugged me for years um and I just see it being such a trap sometimes. I also hate the where there are sort of uh, ladders of development that feel like foregone conclusions um, that, that, you know, if that that moving up is the next step. You mean on an organizational chart? Yeah, that, um, that, you know, I've been the great uh, doer of whatever business Mm -hmm. that you're in. And so my next role should be project manager or team right. leader or right. that's management. That's a totally different set of skills. It I mean, is. I think there's one other thing in this conversation that's super important, where is there are skill sets that, you know, you don't need everybody to be a chief that you need extremely right. good Indians who stick around forever. So I think there's also an opportunity to make it appealing and compelling to be doing just what you're really good at doing. And it doesn't have to be a, a dead end spot. So it, it's, this is why this is so hard, because that's how you end up with, with people who are sort of hitting a ceiling on what you can pay them realistically. But I would, I would challenge that and say, if they have, I just don't know that that's always the case. If they have real value there, you may have to look at it a different way. Well, and that's why I was saying early on that it's such an easy default position for companies to reward based on tenure, because the alternative is often trying to figure out what the accomplishments, what the next steps are. When those next steps aren't moving from, you know, foreman to supervisor to project manager to team lead to whatever it is, when you're staying in the same title, Mm -hmm. the same box, but you're developing and you're evolving and you're you're becoming more valuable to the organization in some way other than what's written on your business card. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that takes a lot of thought and a lot of care and constant development in terms of your discussions and the way leadership interacts with with personnel. And so tenure is a lot easier. Yeah, but <laughs> well, I mean, in the short term. Yeah, exactly. That's why I was laughing because I feel like there are so many things that feel easier in the short term, but then just create infinite. It's like taking all this stuff on your dining room table and putting it in a stack in the corner. Like, yeah, it's it's easier in the moment, yes. but then you end up with this mountain of clutter that's like impossible. Right. There's to clean a day up. of reckoning. There's um, a day of reckoning. <laughs> it's like a movie title. But either way, what I what I really love is whether you're talking about an accomplishment, you know, making it to base camp one, whether you're or or winning the the jujitsu contest uh, or tournament that uh, Chris Brogan was talking about, or just mastering a certain skill. Um, or becoming proficient in a certain procedure. It's just amazing to me that thought of writing it on your palm and and knowing that once that fades, you've still got real estate on your palm to write new and even better accomplishments on. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, just one last thought on that is, is I think that the other place that I see this be so relevant that I'm absolutely going to totally use this next time it comes up is... I mean, if you just think of all the times where as an individual leader or as an organization, you look in the mirror and realize that the skills that have gotten you to where you are right now are not the skills you need to get to the next place. And it absolutely happens every time your company goes through a growth spurt, 
we're absolutely going to come back and do another episode on like organizational puberty. I think there are these stages like <laughs> adolescent, uh, they're just exactly like puberty, like, dear God, it's me, Wagenheim Law, um, where, you know, it's certain, certain numbers of people ranges where these like very predictable things start to happen. And um, so we'll come back to that. But like, as you go through those phases, or as a leader, as you're moving from being president to CEO, or from a division leader to more of a senior position, every one of those shifts re usually requires a completely new set of skills. And the trick is, you know, you need to come into it with confidence. So you need to know those things had been written on your hand, but you're going to need new things there. Yeah, it's... Uh you really, that's the, that's the whole point. You need new things written there. And I think that, that what you had said really, which was what got you here won't get you there. That's, I think, what the, what the real lesson is in terms of these temporary accomplishments. But yeah, so. <laughs> I, I thought went, you were going somewhere with I was. That. <laughs> well, you know what I was going? You know where I was going? I was going, I'm, I was waiting for it to load because there's a... I was like, are you looking something up on yes, your phone? Yes, I was looking something up because there's a book... Because <laughs> it sounded like stalling. You were like pausing and pausing. I was stalling. There's a book <laughs> called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Okay, so basically exactly what I said. It's exactly what yeah. you said. And I'm trying to figure <laughs> out... And it was written so by... Glad. This is what I was going for. Okay. It was written by Marshall Goldsmith. Have what, you read the book? No. Okay, so you don't know that it's better um, than the concept that I just summarized and by saying what got you here. No, the title was just better. All I know is that I read the title. Is okay. that what, if that's what you're asking? Me. Yes, okay. I read the title. So basically, what we've just substantiated is that the thing I said is good enough to write a book about, but we don't know whether the book is good, right? Well, we don't know whether the book is good. We do know that the title is good, right? So, and, right. and really, really, <laughs> okay. if you ask my, my um, son who's in ninth grade, I think he'll tell you that as long as you've read the title, <laughs> yeah. you've done the lion's share Perfect. of the work. Perfect. Um, so right, well, I'm going to go it, write that on my hand. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if I didn't say it before, uh, it was written by Marshall Goldsmith. Love, Shout out to Marshall. I love that you're pitching a book that we know nothing about. <laughs> we do know something about it. We know it has a great title. You know right. what? This is my homework You're welcome, assignment. Marshall. I'm going to read the book between right. now and next episode, and then I'll, Thank you. I'll report back. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, what we want people to report back to us on are the awkward interviews. Please. Um, remember, <laughs> look up SHMS Podcast on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, or you can write them to, uh, to us an email at uh, talk to us at so here's my story dot com. And we'd love to hear from you. We already uh, gave one of the responses, which was hysterical. Yeah. Um, and, and on either Facebook or Twitter, you can also use the hashtag my awkward interview. And if you'd works. like to become a uh, patron, then please go to patreon.com, look up So Here's My Story, and you'll find out all the cool extra stuff. Yeah, within the next few days, that. I think there are going to be some extra, extra things. But. Extra, extra things. Very <laughs> cool. So that's our story. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so grateful for everyone who's listening in and we're extra especially grateful to all of our patrons who've joined us over at patreon.com to support our efforts here. And um, we hope to see you next week. And listen, having told our story, we'd love to hear yours. Oh, yeah. So I guess what we're trying to say is the floor is yours. Go to SoHere'sMyStory.com and join the conversation. Wait, before you go, there are three things that we really want you to know. First, you can find show notes and links to all of the random things we happen to mention during the episode by visiting our website, SoHere'sMyStory.com. The second thing is, we like to talk. And not just to each other. That's right. So what we really want to hear is your story. So while you're there, you'll also find links to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and other ways to contact us with questions, suggestions, or even to share your own story. And if you love the show and want to support future episodes, you'll also find the link to our Patreon page where we share our extra bonus content. Or if you can't support us financially, it'd be great if you could leave us a five-star review at iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever podcast service you use to listen to us. And be sure to tell all your friends. Until next time. 